Welcome to the program. The title of the program is Catholic Coercion Through Civil Law. The Catholics not only attempt but actually do bring about control in many nations of the world through civil law. I remember emphatically when I was in Slovakia in the year 2000, I was asked to speak at different meetings in different uh, places in Slovakia and I met with people and talked with the Slovaks. It was good that um, many of them were quite fluent at English. And it was the year while I was actually there that the Vatican had signed a concordat, as a legal concordat, with the state of Slovakia. The Vatican, the Holy See as they call the Vatican as it deals with politics and deals with civil law, the Vatican is not just a religion, it is also a civil state. And as a civil state, they can work together with other states, prime ministers and um, presidents. And uh, the Vatican had signed a concordat with the Slovak nation. And then the people whom I talked to, most of whom were Bible believers, they were shocked. And they said to me, this means that we will not have control over our property like we had before. And that we could be wanting to build a new church and then the state will not allow us. And we know for certain it means that some of our Christian radio programs and where we broadcast on different stations, they will not be allowed to go out anymore by civil law. And if we persist, and if the civil authorities want to close down a church, it is the police that will turn up, not the archbishop. <laughs> it's the police. And it was, um, I was quite aware at that stage of what, uh, what concordats were. I knew how the damage it had done in Venezuela and in many other nations of the world where in Venezuela because of um, Concordat there's only 1% of the nation who are Biblically Christians. It, they've had a, a Concordat there for many, many years. I knew about this, but now to be actually in a nation at the time when the Concordat was signed, it brought home the reality, the claws and the teeth, as it were, of Rome as a civil power and exercising control or coercion over, over, over nations in civil law. And so people are not aware of this and it's of uttermost importance that we speak on it and I'm just uh, trusting that it will be used and that you will, as you view this program, that you will inform others and, and, and awake people to the reality of what the Roman Catholic Church is and how they control nations in civil law. And uh, I am really privileged to have with me Bill Mancaro because he is very well versed in these things and he actually had worked in the um, United States with the Congress and in drafting legislation uh, years ago uh, when he was much younger. He had actually worked in Congress and in giving advice regarding legislation. And uh, he has um, some interesting views having visited the Vatican. He has uh, some, uh, some uh, photographs that he took there of where they depicted their control in the past. So that'll be explained later on. So it's a real privilege to have Bill Mancaro here. So I would ask if you begin by explaining, Bill, some of the principle or the principles that the Vatican has and how it works Certainly. in this way. Thank you for having me, Richard. I'm honored to 
to be here, and it's, it is a subject that uh, is, is very interesting uh, to me, and some uh, I've followed for n a number of years. Um, historically, if we look at it, and I'm glad you mentioned the Concordats, and I think we need to, to, to go into that in a little more detail in a moment and some history of it. The principle, as you know, on, on which the Church of Rome has proceeded historically uh, is that in virtue of its spiritual character, it claims to have control over earthly kings and princes. Um, it's, it openly claims, it has claimed historically, to be vested with the power uh, of controlling and disposing of rulers of countries. Um, coercion through civil law among European nations is what the Catholic Church uh, thrived on for many, many years through the Middle Ages. Uh, this coercion, in fact, was the primary uh, um, underpinning, I guess you'd say, uh, of its power, uh, worldly power, during the 600 years of the Inquisition uh, and in the growth of her religious power system generally throughout the centuries. Um, her methods have changed. Let's make no mistake, but let's not confuse the change of methods with the change of goal. Yes, the yes, goal. yes. <laughs> Uh, the goal was the same, and uh, we're going to see, Lord willing, in this video, that uh, as you said, these concordats uh, are, the, are the underpinnings. The way that the uh, Catholic Church has grown in strength in numbers is in proportion to her legal agreements with other nations. And uh, Richard, uh, you're certainly well versed in this. Can you give us some historical background on that? Yes, I will explain some things. It was on uh, February the 10th in uh, 17, I think it was 1798 exactly, that General uh, Louise Alexandre Berthier, he was the chief of staff of, of Napoleon and, uh, you know, the commander of, of Napoleon and he entered Rome uh, and uh, he proclaimed that uh, the whole area around there was to become a, a, a Roman Republic public and he uh, he commanded that Pope Pius the uh, sixth who was uh, had t a temporal power you know the popes in those days had a nation they had states, states. In, 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 and they they had temporal power he he removed him from his papal throne in that way he removed the civil uh, control that uh, the Vatican had there physically over those states in Italy and uh, he was um, taken in that way from his throne. He still remained a, a so-called spiritual leader, but he was uh, he was removed. And uh, but he he uh, worked out together with cardinals and all. And then it was after that that they began to reorganize. It was they they were going to reorganize so that they could claim back. Uh, their civil power and they be able, their authority to work civilly, and it was going to be differently. And it, uh, it was, um, it was um, John Henry Newman, who was a quite infamous person, who had uh, uh, so-called left the Anglican Church and became a. <laughs> became a Catholic and even a cardinal. He was, he got the the, ro the robes of scarlet and uh, the, the hat and all that goes with it, you know. And he became a, a cardinal, Cardinal John Henry Newman. He, he, uh, he began working in England with the, uh, with English uh, authorities and he, he um, began in, a, it was in 1844, uh, he began, uh, the Oxford movement and it was to bring England back under the control of the Vatican not just religiously but even civilly and uh, it, it was um, they changed uh, what had been the biblical gospel <laughs> you know of the, to uh, a, a a sacramental system which the roman church controls and they got in league of course with uh, with uh, members of parliament and they began to work out things spiritually as the basis and then it was going to take some years before the the civil side was working but John Henry Newman in that sense was a was quite quite talented in the evil that he did and how he he brought in Romanism brought, brought Romanism back to 
um, to um, predominance and that then that Romanism could then enter into more into the civil side of things. Then um, a, a pope that is quite well known in history, Pius IX, Pio Nono, they used to call him in the in the the, the uh, in the Latin form of the name or the Italian form, but Pius the Ninth. He was the longest reigning pope there's ever been. He lived longer as a pope than any other pope has done. In the um, in in 1870, he set out to get the church to have a leader that could not be questioned. So that if the Pope makes decisions, you know, regarding doctrine or dogma, he cannot be questioned. And that if they make decisions regarding their civil authority, they cannot be questioned. And uh, there was huge debate because a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, um, the cardinals and the, the bishops and archbishops, you know, the, the top brass of, of, of Rome, uh, they um, did not agree to the dogma that was to be was to be pronounced. The dogma was on the fact that the Pope is infallible, <laughs> that he cannot err. <laughs> now you would know, or anybody knows, that nobody is infallible. <laughs> it's it's God alone who cannot lie. You know what I mean? Who cannot uh, ma let God be true and every man a liar, as Scripture says. It's it. It's it's a ludicrous thing that a man is infallible, you know. <laughs> it's it, they say in matters of faith and morals they try to define it. Uh, it's not that he's he's infallible if he tells you what you're to have for breakfast tomorrow. <laughs> it's that he's you, he's uh, infallible in things of faith and and, and morals. How how um, faith affects other aspects of life, and this became a dogma in eighteen. 17 and it really meant now that the the Pope was far more capable of uh, maneuvering the Catholic Church and that he was the one who had the chief say before uh, the bishops and archbishops had much more of a say before things could be uh, implemented in Catholic we have one man you know as I say one top dog <laughs> one man and uh, it was um, it was to it was to be translated in really definitive ways it it meant that after his death and later on it was under another pope that we had in 1917 the first code of canon law there's a large volume here in my library the code of canon law these are the laws of the catholic church to do with not only doctrine but to do with their control in other ways, including civil law, that the um, that you cannot question the authority, and that the the um, that the Catholic Church is not subservient to anybody on earth, but they they must be subservient to the Catholic Church. So it was a the Code of Canon Law is a is a horrendous thing when it comes to what we're talking about civil law and uh, how this is in their law that how they are to be respected and obeyed and uh, it was then that um, the things you know really began to take have teeth in them you know so that they could they could implement more easily what they wanted to do. As you say, there was a lot of controversy over this doctrine of papal infallibility. Uh, there's a very interesting book, which I know, I believe I've seen on your, in your library, uh, yeah. How the Pope Became Infallible. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> it's a, it is, and um, I have written on that and made a video on that in the past. Yeah, yes, okay. yes, yes, okay. yes. Uh, it's it's uh, remarkable to see. And what the Catholic Church has done, they really put themselves in a box by creating this papal infallibility because it means never can anything that has been done by previous popes be ever changed. Yes, yes, yes. Even though they have denied things that other popes have done and, yes. uh, and they have condemned some popes in the past as heretics. <laughs> and uh, anyway... And uh, puts them in a box. When, when I was, you, you mentioned earlier when I, uh, I was in the Vatican uh, a few years ago and I 
uh, went into the little bookstore that they were actually a large, fairly large bookstore, but went into a back kind of a back room, so a public room, and I happened to look up and these very ancient frescoes are up there, and this room was used for something other than a bookstore centuries ago, but they've made it, they've kind of made it a back room now. I'm looking at these frescoes, and I realize that uh, they certainly appear to be, uh, each one of them has a different country, like Bohemia's name, and Slovakia, some other number of other countries named, and appears to be the, the king of that nation on his knees before the Pope presenting his crown. Uh, yeah. and, and other types of pictures like that. And I was just amazed. In fact, I took uh, videos of it because I, I really couldn't believe that, that they had that there and that they hadn't covered them up because <laughs> I'm sure they don't want people to see that. Uh, but it, they, frankly, they clearly show in stark detail the Vatican's contempt for every civil government. Um, whether it's a king or a president or a parliament or Congress, they all must be under the authority of the Pope. And I'm just not saying it. Let's, I mean, there's public documents. Um, here, I, I, I brought uh, Pope Boniface VIII in the, the papal bull Unum Sanctum. Remember, uh, this papal pronouncement can never be changed. He's infallible. It's ex cathedra. Boniface wrote, quote, Certainly the one who denies that the temporal sword, and of course that means the authority of the civil government, who, the person who denies that it is in the power of Peter, it, they have not listened well to the word of the Lord. Just continuing with the quote, both therefore, he's talking about the uh, po political uh, rule and the spiritual rule, are in the power of the church. That is to say, the spiritual and the material sword, but the former is to be administered for the church, but the latter by the church. The former is in the hands of the priest, the latter by the hands of kings and soldiers, but at the will and sufferance of the priest. And he continues, however, one sword ought to be subordinated to the other, and temporal authority, political power, subjected to spiritual power, which of course is the Catholic Church. And that's his pronouncement by the Pope. Uh, so in plain language, the, 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 the ruler of any country must kneel before the Pope and obey his commands. Now if that wasn't enough, there's another one. Yes, uh, yes. Which you certainly know of, but I, I want our audience to know about this. Uh, infallible papal command from the syllabus of errors condemned by Pius. That's Pope Pius the Ninth, on December 8, 1864. It says that the civil government of any nation has no authority over the Catholic Church. Out and out plain statement. Specifically, the way it does it, it, it puts up a proposition and says this proposition is false. So the way it's done, it says, quote, uh, it condemns the idea that, quote, the civil power can define what are the rights and limits within which the church may exercise authority. And they say that's, that's wrong. That's flat out wrong. So that Vatican document also claims in, in statement uh, for, uh, 42, but what I just read is statement 19, by the way, from the syllabus. In statement 42, it says the Catholic Church's laws are above the civil government laws. Just out and out, there it is. Uh, so and you can look at that up on papalencyclicals.net on the internet. And if you doubt that any that this is still the binding authority of the church today, the binding teaching of the church, oh well that was 1864, you know the church doesn't believe that anymore. The Catholic Encyclopedia today states, quote, the syllabus, which is what I just quoted from, is a decision given by the Pope speaking as universal teacher and judge to Catholics the world over all Catholics, therefore, are bound to accept the syllabus. Exteriorly, they may neither in word nor in writing oppose its content, contents. They must also assent to it interiorly." End quote from the Catholic Encyclopedia. So it certainly is still binding. On yeah, that. Yes. Uh, well, I, I spoke about the uh, 1798, uh, how the yes the um, Catholic Church lost its civil power when Pius VI was removed as, as you know, as a controller of, of civil states. And, uh, but how did it gain it back? Uh, it's quite interesting, it was under the Catholic uh, um, controller, you know, the, of the nation of Italy, Mussolini, in, in 1929, that the Vatican entered into negotiation with him uh, that um, while 
Italy had become a republic that into this nation that land and the status of being a state would be given to the Catholic Church. Now it's about 108 acres, the size of an 18 home golf course. <laughs> but it's, they were given territory which they called a state, it's Vatican State. And uh, this was recognized in civil law. And then as a civil state, they were to claim that they were the oldest state in, in, in Europe and in the civilized world and that then they, they would have precedence over other states. So this was in, in 1729 and uh, it was the first of these legal agreements which later on were to be called concordats between the uh, it was the first uh, at that time in, in you know in, in at that level there were some others before in as regards uh, other nations particularly the Latino nations you know there was some other concordance with them but this was the first like of the of the nations that were U European and quite large like Italy it was the first of these and um, the most infamous was the concordate of Pius the Twelfth with Adolf Hitler. Mm. Um, people wonder why it was, you know, that uh, the Catholic Church wouldn't condemn Hitler, and why the Catholics, particularly, were uh, predominant. The generals and a lot of the officers in the army, Hitler's army, why it was, you know, that the Pope would not condemn. The Pope had made an agreement to endorse Catholicism and they held to their agreement and uh, it had a uh, huge repercussions right across Europe and that was um, the, the agreement that uh, Pius XII had with Adolf Hitler. Mm. So um, it's, uh, it continues to be uh, that Mother Church continues to impose its law mm. on other nations. Uh, can you have um, you have um, quoted to us some of what you saw when you were in the Vatican, and uh, and read from Unum Sanctum and uh, read from um, the, the Pope uh, by Pius the um, Boniface the Eighth, and uh, all of that is really really important. And uh, we have then the kings and presidents being subject to. To um, to um, the Catholic Church. Now, um, the Catholic decrees are quite unbelievable. It is it's that they can um, impose their teaching on other nations, and it's done by a concordat. Uh, you can put it in Google search engines and it'll come up and you'll find uh, um, you will find a concordat. Usually the search engines take you to the Zenith, it's the Catholic uh, web page for transmitting all important Catholic um, concepts and ideas and plans to other parts of the world and how they've been implemented. So Zenith is a and you can find out just what a concordat I is. It is, um, it is a civil agreement of the Vatican as a civil state, and they call it the Holy See when they're a civil state, with a, another government. And in that government, uh, the Catholic Church uh, insists on certain things. They don't always get the whole list of things, but they usually get most of them. Uh, um, they uh, concord that they try to insist that in civil law, it's for the Catholic Church to decide on what is the religion and how it to be exercised in the nation. Now. Um, they haven't succeeded in that because nations uh, want to have religious freedom like the United States is not, it's, it's very founding principles, you know, that, the, that the, you cannot impose religion. So they're not, they're not too successful in getting that except with some of the South American nations where they have concordats. And then that they have the right of education 
uh, and so we have Catholic schools all across the world and they're quite well known academically they're usually quite good but they're really controlled they get in children uh, from age and they um, they they shape the minds I know uh, I was sent to a Catholic Jesuit school from when I was a young boy until I was 18 years old all my what we call primary and secondary education in the states like well, up to high school was all with the Jesuits and they shaped my mind and one of the things that they shaped my mind was the Catholic control in civil law and uh, that was as a young boy in, in, in a Jesuit college so they they usually insist on education that they have that they can have their schools and they try to see that other 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 churches are not allowed to have uh, have their their worship that's what the people in Slovakia were afraid of when that concordat came in and then they they um, they insist that the um, they have the right to appoint bishops in in every country directly before bishops used to be appointed as people would um, elect them you know the different priests and different people in the country that they would be able to directly appoint bishops in, in different countries of the world and then that they Catholic laws on marriage and the Catholic has real control over marriage which is uh, quite quite horrendous they take control of the basic unit of society which is uh, husband and wife mm -hmm. and their laws on marriage and how a marriage can be annulled it, uh, they say they don't believe in divorce but their annulment is is like a um, you can you can you can do it legally under the Catholic Church you can be married or, for years and still have an annulment. Yeah, yeah, yes and it, 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 it's 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 it is horrendous I remember talking to a, a couple in England one time and they had a, it means that the the, the the marriage had been declared null by the Catholic Church and mental with civil art children are illegitimate then we, this marriage never was <laughs> so, course, anyway it's but the this is they're ludicrous but nonetheless they enforce them and so that this is the the and then that they have a right then that their laws will be civilly enforced so like the people in Slovakia that I told you about if if you disobey and you're not supposed to have a, a, a radio station unless the 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 Catholic Church allows it, it's the police that turn up mm. and close down your radio station, and it, it's um, it is um, <laughs> quite frightening and quite real, and this is why people must know about these things. It was in 19. 80 that there was um, an agreement signed with um, many more of the European and Latino nations and the South American nations and the, the Vatican has uh, uh, given details of the countries who have signed on for these agreements as I say you will get it on Zenit and other web pages um, they have actually said, and you, you find it there on the internet, that the desire for countries around the world to have relationships with the Vatican has increased, especially since the fall of the Berlin Wall and those countries in Eastern Europe. Those nations, uh, the Vatican made, you know, uh, contacted civilly with the leaders of these nations and quite readily <laughs> they signed on to concordats. So it was a uh, it is um, it is quite it is fact and it's frightening when we read of these concordats from 1950 to 1999 there were 128 concordats mm. signed between Rome and different nations and then after that for nine years there were 43 uh, concordats and it continues that more and more nations um, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth was boasting about how many nations they had, and uh, the the many that came in at his time, and uh, it's um, 176 at the moment, and that's it. It is um, it is frightening to see how the Catholic Church has control in these nations, and that they can dictate in civil law what should be and what should not be mm -hmm. and uh, it's um, 
it's, it's fact and we just have to realize what the facts well, absolutely. are. Absolutely. They, they participate, the Vatican is uh, deeply involved, as you well know, in uh, all sorts of uh, UN organizations, uh, NGOs, non-governmental organizations, uh, uh, the Council of Europe, the European commun Communities, the uh, uh, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the Vatican is deeply involved in that, the Organization of American States, the Organization of African Unity, or for African Unity rather, uh, even, even, even the International Council on Grain has a Vatican <laughs> representative. So the idea, well, this is just a, uh, this is the Catholic Church, it's a religion, it's, it's a very political uh, uh, organization as well. Um, and I think a, a, an important point is Vatican, as you said, has uh, uh, ambassadors, representatives, uh, in fact, uh, maintaining diplomatic relations with 172 countries right now of the world. That number has actually gone up to 179, 179. as far as, as I know, and it's, uh, okay. it, it's currently with, um, uh, it all adds up to 196 nations in the world. So that's about 90 percent. Yeah, yeah, yes. Vatican has relations, diplomatic relations with about 90 percent of the countries in the world. No other church has diplomatic relations with countries. Yes, and the church is supposed to be a spiritual entity. Exactly. exactly. I don't know that the Presbyterian Church or the Methodist Church or the Baptist Church has ambassadors to the countries. I don't believe No, so. they don't. I don't think so. I mean, it would be ludicrous if you suggested that. <laughs> really, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? Uh, but the Catholic Church does. So, uh, uh, according to the Catholic Almanac, um, Papal representatives, quote, receive from the Roman pontiff the charge of representing him in a fixed way in the various nations or regions of the world. So they receive the charge of representing the Pope. That's what it says. Uh, and the Catholic Encyclopedia says, quote, in Catholic countries, the Pope's ambassadors have precedence over other members of the diplomatic body. Yes, yes, yes. So they're not only ambassadors, they're super ambassadors, because yeah, they're yes. Catholic and Catholic. It's, it's, uh, it was uh, amazing when, when I was uh, a Catholic priest in Trinidad, and I was, um, after I nearly died a serious accident, I began studying the Bible, and then I saw how it's no church that saves, there's no church that, uh, it's, it's, um, it's purely the gospel message that we're all sinners and before Holy God we have to recognize that and trust in Christ alone who died in the place of sinners who believe on Him. Indeed. And when I saw that and I began to stand up for it, it was, um, I was having real trouble with the Archbishop, but at the end, the one who said that I really had to leave was the, the Vatican Legate. Mm. You know, the, um, the, ambassador, the ambassador from the Pope. Yeah. <laughs> he was the one that uh, was demanding that. And I, I left voluntarily, <laughs> but uh, I probably would, would not be voluntarily had the, had the legacy, had the say. And so uh, uh, Lord Act, you know, the, the quite well-known, uh, he remained Catholic, but he was one of the ones who criticize the Catholic Church and on, on the civil side besides and doctrinal side he, he said it's the fiend <laughs> skulking behind the crucifix. That's how he's a great way with words <laughs> and that, that was his definition of <laughs> what Catholicism is, the fiend skulking behind the crucifix, appearing to be religious and then a fiend and th she's shown her, uh, her, her evil ways particularly in civil law. And um, can you explain then uh, just uh, the claim for international recognition and uh, how, it's, how this has gone, Bill? Well, certainly, very briefly, um, the, the Catholic Church officially rejects the separation of church and state. Yeah, the, yes, the yes. Official statements. Uh, one, one example uh, is a document called the Allocution Acerbissimum, uh, number 55. The Vatican condemns again. It, it it's uh, stated in a way, and then it says this is wrong. Okay, so that's how they they do this. They make they put the, put up this statement number fifty five. The church ought to be separated from the state, and the state from the church. And they say no, that's wrong. We condemn that statement. Uh, in fact, the Catholic Church officially claims the power of using force to enact its will. 
many people don't know this, uh, in the Pope's Apostolic Letter of August 22nd, 1851, sentence 24, and remember this is, uh, this is the infallible Pope speaking, um, uh, because they, he's the Pope, even though it wasn't claimed until later, it's retroactive. Uh, the Pope condemns this statement. He says this statement is false. Quote, the Church has not the power of using force, nor has she any temporal power, direct or indirect. End quote. And they say that's wrong. Uh, we, we reject that. So the papacy asserts that the Catholic Church has temporal, that is political, earthly power, which of course it has. <laughs> Moreover, it asserts that it has the right to use force to enact its agenda. Officially says it's used force. Uh, Pope Paul VI, in his 1967 uh, encyclical Popularum Progressio, Progressio uh, is an entire section called Toward an Effective World Authority. And let me just read to you from paragraph 78. There's much more that we could to talk about. We have limited time. Quote, this international collaboration on a worldwide scale requires institutions that will prepare, coordinate, and direct it until finally there is established an order of justice which is universally recognized. Continuing with the quote, who does not see the necessity of thus establishing progressively a world authority capable of acting effectively in the juridical and political sectors? And you can see that on papal, uh, papal encyclicals.net. Richard, the Pope says he wants a world authority, uh, probably a, a, also known as a new world order. He didn't specifically say that, but the code words. What else should we know about what the Pope says he wants uh, regarding this world authority? Yes, uh, that's quite interesting that you asked that question because in on December the 3rd, 2012, um, the um, Pope at the time, Benedict the Sixteenth published um, from the Pontifical Council of Justice and Peace. He pronounced the, the fact that, that he said, quotation, the blessed uh, pious uh, John the Twenty-Third has motivated and uh, the commitment of building a global community with a corresponding authority for the um, common good, <laughs> for the common good of humanity, there's to be a global community and the authority. And then it says that the Benedict called it a return to the, an international monetary and financial uh, centers. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's all to do also with money and uh, financial matters. And uh, they want to have control on that too. Um, the present Pope, um, Francis has made a decree on that. Uh, um, we've made a video on it where we call the Vatican teaching worse than Marx because it really, it really decrees that all things really are in, in public uh, domain, that everything belongs to everybody. And uh, it's, uh, it's socialism at, at the extreme and uh, it's official Catholic dogma. So it's, um, it's a, a world authority, of course, where they are, again, to be the top dog, and they're the mm -hmm. decree, and, and, the, uh, and popes uh, are to uh, command uh, presidents and uh, kings and parliaments of what to do, and it's, uh, it's very, very real, and you can, you can um, make searches and see that what we are saying is fact. And I would encourage anybody, and it's interesting to get uh, emails from people who have, who have, when we've made videos like this, who have researched and saw that what we are saying is quite real. Well, that's, that's exactly the point. This is not just things that we've made up or some um, crazy book that, you know, that uh, conspiracy theory book that has no foundation. We're just simply quoting what the Vatican has said. Yes, and, yes, yes. Uh, that's 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 uh, that's the bottom line. Uh, in the encyclical you uh, you mentioned, uh, Pope Benedict wrote that a uh, one-world economic system would quote open up the unprecedented possibility of large-scale redistrib redistribution of wealth on a worldwide scale. End quote. Well, that's that's socialism, pure and simple socialism. In fact, Pope Benedict called for the redistribution of wealth no less than eight times in that one encyclical. And we know uh, Francis is, uh, is as much or more so of a socialist than, uh, than uh, Benedict. 
so redistribution is wealth is, is of course socialism. Uh, this political coercion through civil law by the Catholic Church and economic and social co coercion by the, by the Catholic Church uh, in, in daily life is all part of the official Roman Catholic objective. Uh, we've quoted so many documents. Uh, um, let me just if, uh, indulge you with one more. Uh, Pope Benedict the 16th in his June 29th, 2009 encyclical Caritas and Veritate, section 7, quote, Man's earthly activity, when inspired and sustained by charity, contributes to the building of the universal city of God, which is the goal of the history of the human family. Doesn't that sound nice? <laughs> it's all love and goal and, and cooperation and Continuing with the quote, in an increasingly globalized society, the common good and the effort to obtain it cannot fail to assume the dimensions of the whole human family, that is to say the community of peoples and nations, as in such a way as to shape the earthly city in unity and peace, rendering it to some degree in anticipation and prefiguration of the undivided city of God. You see how they couch all these terms, but you look at them carefully. He's calling for one world government, a globalized society, one socialist economic system, and who would make the decisions in this? Who do you think wants to sit at the head of the table? <laughs> yes, the Vatican, yes, the Pope, of course. Yes, they're they're they they are producing a snare to nations of the world, and Precisely. you just have to look at the South American nations that have been under the thumb for years and see how um, economically bankrupt they are, and. Uh, Politically and morally and and, and, and uh, socially, it's it's uh, uh, it's quite frightening to see the facts and uh, the um, the um, the Lord Jesus Christ said, "My kingdom is not of this world." <laughs> he said emphatically that it's not a kingdom in worldly terms. Um, the popes said really that they are a kingdom of this world, that they have, they are to have civil power and that they are to be obeyed. So it's, a, it's diametrically opposed to what Christ Jesus taught and what should be the norm of, 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 of Bible believers. Why it is that we, we noted that no Baptist church or Presbyterian church or any other church has civil power or, or, or attempts to have, but the Vatican does. It's the kingdom of this world and it is the, it is the, uh, it is what they, they go back to and they, they, um, they continue to plan and uh, it's consistent with the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the new official book that they have. And in paragraph 567 it says, um, the Roman Church is the seed and beginning of this kingdom. It's the kingdom whereby they control and coerce nations. It's the seed and, um, and the, the keys are entrusted to Peter. <laughs> and when they say to Peter, they say that, you know, Peter is claimed to be first pope, <laughs> which he wasn't, and uh, historically, it's, um, he didn't even go to Rome. But anyway, so it's, uh, it's amazing, it the kingdom, they talk about as the kingdom. That's in paragraph 567. If you have a catechism of the Catholic Church, look it up. The keys are entrusted to Peter. That is the authority, and they claim to have authority then, uh, not just spiritual but worldly kingdom, and be able to to uh, to control nation of the world. Can you can give us a an overview of this um, thing and just how how we are to face these things, Bill? Can you well? Two, two things. First, from a uh, political, I guess, standpoint, contrasting uh, the Christian view with, with the Catholic uh, papal view, um, are there, there are two systems that stand in direct antagonism uh, toward one another. The Christian uh, sep separates church and state. Catholicism brings church and wants church and state together with the church ruling over the state. Uh, so that's one major difference. Uh, Christian wants religious freedom, 
The papal system requires every person give up their conscience and follow the dictates of the Pope. Uh, that's another uh, example of, of how the systems differ. Uh, the Christian system encourages the uh, faculties of the mind, independent thinking under the Lord Jesus Christ, the, Holy, the influence of the Holy Spirit, uh, personal independence. Uh, the papal system, just look around the world, look at the countries that are Catholic versus countries that are Christian and uh, see the difference in the, in the uh, prosperity uh, the economic systems, the personal freedoms, uh, the papal system crushes out the spirit uh, by, uh, its, uh, by insisting on passive obedience and submission to its dictates. Uh, the papal system uh, basically turns uh, economies into, into a form of feudalism, uh, uh, under, you know, which is an authoritarian uh, uh, type of uh, economic uh, system. But we don't want to end on that. <laughs> and uh, Richard, I, I hope you'll you'll uh, uh, share w with me uh, in in saying that uh, personal faith uh, and salvation uh, are from the Lord. Uh, scripture says, "Him hath God exalted with His right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins." Of course, Jesus Christ is. Yeah. Saying. Yes. Uh, scripture says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. The Lord himself declares, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. But then he also says, he that believes not shall be damned, which is a, a very sobering thought. Yes, 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 yes. It is, um, it is Christ Jesus who also said, he said, come unto me, all you are, who are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And uh, that is important, first of all, in a spiritual way. Uh, I remember the more I read scripture, the more I saw I was a sinner way back in the, in the 80s yeah. <laughs> in Trinidad. Were you like Martin Luther going to confession? And then <laughs> yes, I, I was doing no more. Yeah, I was yeah. continually going to confession and doing all the sacraments and I, yeah. I'm still uh, I'm not one whit better. The people that I minister to, uh, they're not one whit better. And I remember going to one man one night and uh, his wife had called me. He was dying and uh, I, I heard his confession and he couldn't say it too loud, but he could tell me his sins and I gave him absolution, I gave him communion. And then I anointed him with holy oils, they said, on the forehead, on the hands, which they're supposed to do. They're supposed to assure that you're going to go uh, that you're going to go to purgatory or, or heaven directly, but one or the other, you know. And man, that man died cursing God. I couldn't. Mm. I was frightened. I never saw it before or since, but I was frightened. Here, he's got all the sacraments, right. and he's cursing God for his pain. He was dying of cancer. And I was frightened, you know, because Christ Jesus says, come to all who labor and heavy laden. It's first of all laden with sin. Yeah. And we, we come to him directly. Say, Lord, I am a sinner. I need your grace. I am without any righteousness of my own. If we, can, if we confess our sins, Scripture says, he is faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yes, <laughs> and actually we become clothed with his righteousness and it's, it's, such, it's such a joy. But that is the answer. But it's also we come to him, he gives us rest. You can understand biblical principles of government. Just begin in Romans 13 mm -hmm. <laughs> and you'll see principles for government laid out in the Absolutely. scriptures. Absolutely. and. Uh, what, what is the situation of a government and what authority it has over its people. But you will see it does not apply to any religious body. You will see from the scriptures that what, what the Vatican is doing is an abomination before God. If there was a stronger word, I would use it, but it is. It, it's a blasphemy because it's a claiming spiritually what is spiritually a contradiction. Christ said, my kingdom is not of this world. His kingdom is not worldly. 
and the Lord gives us wisdom and it's such a joy it's such a, a joy to me to hear from people um, and uh, as we make these programs and uh, email address my email address will be at the foot of the screen it'd be lovely to hear from you and on this particular topic uh, Bill we've made quite a number of shows together and I think that this is probably one of the most important ones we've ever made and I, I would love to hear from you and it's always an encouragement to hear how people's minds are opened and I appeal to you to make this program known to others forward the URL to other people as you see it and on, on the whatever station you see it on and I would appeal to you to forward this to others and uh, may God be glorified and may souls be saved and that's mm -hmm. that is our prayer as we finish that we would see the kingdom of Christ in all its reality that we would tr trust on him more and more and know the joy of what it is to be a believer sharing everlasting life now and that we would see in contrast to the glory of Christ Jesus and his kingdom which is forever Amen. that we would see the horrors of this Roman Catholic Church and the, the guile in which it is implemented and so may God be glorified may souls be saved to the praise and glory of his grace now and forevermore Amen and Amen Praise God